All right, here we are. Another episode of Let There Be Talk. It is Monday evening. The podcast is late. November 25th, just a few days before Thanksgiving. So I'm going to give you guys an all out happy Thanksgiving right now, a few days early. Or maybe you're listening to this podcast on a plane ride to see some family. Yes, here it is. It's here. Sorry it's late. I, uh, I have been on a work schedule that is making my fucking head spin, my voice fried, and my, my uh, brain, my brain is cooked. I was trying to get this out last night. I was, uh, I was just too fried and just tapped out. And then I had to get up early this morning for a little physical therapy keep that neck going and uh and then you know i recorded two podcasts today everything always falls on the on one day everything i don't know if i could just get stuff and say that's tuesday let's do wednesday let's but it doesn't work like that everything seems to come on one day anyway enough rambling here it is andy kindler is here today an absolute comedian legend, uh, heavily, uh, heavily in the alt comedy scene in the 90s, and of course, uh, just killing it right now at 63 years old. I, I pray that I am working and doing quality work like Andy Kindler at 63. That's 10 years from now for me, and... Uh, God, I mean, hats off to this man. He has been in the game most of his life. Hitting the comedy store in 1978. Amazing, man. He was there in the 70s and started doing comedy, and he's been doing comedy ever since. And a lot of what he talked to me about I could relate to, and I learned a lot on this podcast. I love having comedians on once in a while that uh, that I can just learn everything from. This guy is a, a fucking, this guy is a Yoda, a Yoda of comedy. And it was great to sit down and talk to him. And if you don't know any of his work, dive in immediately and check out all his stuff. We talk all kinds of great stuff, including his uh, once a year keynote speech at JFL just for laughs in Montreal the uh, semi kind of roasting of the business and comedians in the business which everybody loves every year to hear and you can hear some of them on uh, YouTube I believe uh, every year I tune in uh, I finally got to go to JFL a couple years ago but before that I would just tune in as soon as it was done, someone would post it, and I wanted to hear what he was talking about. And, and you know, he was on the hit show, Everybody Loves Raymond. This guy is, this guy, like I said, is, I'm not using the word lightly. This guy is a legend in the comedy world, and it's great to have him on. Before I get the episode going, let's uh, give a shout out to everyone that came out to the Terrapin Station crossroads show terrapin crossroads i always call it terrapin station because that is my favorite grateful dead song the terrapin crossroads show was unbelievable it was sold out i saw people there that i have not seen in 35 years and if you want to hear more about it go to my patreon.com slash dean del rey channel and i talk all about the crossroads show the new auto, uh, LA auto show that I went to on Sunday and, uh, some other great stuff. Uh, okay. New Patreoners, Corey Schmail, Marvin Godfrey, Danny Butitata, Butitata. <laughs> I love it. I, I, I just know I fucked that up. Travis, Poltress, thank you. Welcome to the Patreon channel. Thank you for your support. Real quick, upcoming gigs. December 12th, I will be at the La Jolla Comedy Store doing a Toys for Tots show. Bring a toy, get in free. This is uh, every year. 
Um, Mike Venn, my boy Mike Venn, does the Toys for Tots uh, show at the La Jolla Comedy Store. It's a great cause. I will be headlining that. December 21st, I'm in Vegas with Bill Burr at the Cosmopolitan. December 27, Caluso Casino with uh, Joey Diaz. December 28th, Palace of Fine Arts with Joey Diaz. Fresno, January 4th, the Comedy Cellar in Vegas, January 13th through the 19th, the Stress Factory in New Jersey, January 31 and February 2nd. Those are the gigs. They're all on DeanDelRay.com, all the ticket links there. I love all you guys. Let's keep the candles lit. Here it is, episode number 504, Mr. Andy Kindler. Oh, all right. Here we are. This is this is a great guest today. I mean, I, <laughs> I got I, excited I, about that. Yeah, Sorry. I got to tell you. I mean, I, I I I love all my guests, but I've been wanting to talk to you for years, and uh, something very cool happened that I think happens between comedians once in a while. You're in some fucking weird city, and you run into someone at five in the morning at the airport that you don't think you're gonna see a comedian. And then you immediately just like it lights up your day. And that happened to you and I in Omaha when I was there with Joey Diaz, which, by the way, Joey says hello. I hope he's okay. Yep, he is all right. We yeah. left him at the baggage claim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a major, now that wasn't a major mistake. I mean, we wanted to get home. So it's like, as much as you may love another comic, we wanted to get on the shuttle. And who knows how, lo- how many different, with all of his props. How many different his props? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be funny if Joey was a prop comic, right? <laughs> what did he say? He said, um, "50-year-old guy, and I'm dressed in a what shirt?" Did he say he had on? Batman shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. that was great. He was hilarious, and I I've been looking for the uh, those um, high caliber. Oh, whatever, yeah. whatever oh, he was yeah, taking, yeah. whatever a- made him pull Apex. his ha- pull his hamstring, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. I'll, I'll hook you up with that. Actually, uh, Apex, uh, and then I just gave you the uh, CBD line. Uh, we're like old guys. I, I can't believe. First of all, I said we're like old guys. I'm 53, but you're 63. Hey, hey! I told you. Didn't my my non PR person tell you? Uh, you gotta have to take that out, and then I will do a, a ADR digital diet. What is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll come over and do forty three. Forty three. You're forty three. Twenty seven. You're ten years younger. No, than I'm sixty three. There's no way. I used to say I used to try and hide a little bit, but uh, by saying like, hey, when you turn fifty in show business. Yeah. But now I just say, when I when you turn fifty in show business, I don't remember what that was like. It was so many years ago. So. <laughs> Yeah, I do this. I do this joke from my act. I say uh, they love aging in Hollywood. They love it so. I, I'm pitching a lot of shows. I'm pitching a show called Aging Jews. Oh, they just they love it. That's what they look for. They go, what's what are the more mature people have to say? Maybe people who watch Murder She Wrote. Those kind of people. What do they have to say? Get them in my office. I'm sick of this young, youthful, handsome. <laughs> well, the young movement. people aren't watching TV. Right. So you need to get some dudes uh, my age or your age on there because people go, now this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> this ain't that fucking millennials, you know? Well, also, people who are young, they don't want to watch necessarily watch people their own age be funny. It's not, that's not a prerequisite for comedy. Yeah. Like, look, I want a, a, a young look or something. I mean, even the guys in Saturday Night Live, that which was like really influenced me, I mean, they were... Maybe, I guess they were young, but some of them were like 30 or something like that, which would be counterintuitive to rock and roll. Yeah. Isn't well, it worse in music? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's worse in music, so that's why I thought I kind of was just clueless. I was just dumb. I was like, oh, look at these guys. I love them. You know, Burr, uh, uh, Marin, they're, you know, you, uh, Rogan, these guys are my age. We're all good. You know, like, <laughs> I, I, you forget, it. well, they've been doing it 25, 30 years. You just, I, I don't know, I was on the outside, and then I got in. And I never complain, and I don't give a fuck, because in this era, you just build your own thing. Yeah. And then one day they come, and you charge them like a motherfucker for right. it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's funny that you talk about Saturday Night Live because 
when I was young, that is my whole entryway into comedy. I'm 53. I watched season one, two, three, four of Saturday Night Live. Absolutely worshipped it. I was a John Belushi freak. I loved uh, Bill Murray. Uh, I loved Caddyshack. I loved, uh, you know, uh, all that kind of... Those guys, the first run of the Nat Prime Time uh, people, Gilda Radner was, at, yeah. you know, Rosanna Anna Dana. That that shit killed me. Yeah, that was the great, and that, and also uh, SCTV. Oh yeah, SCTV, yep. uh, the Canadian version. Yeah, but it was more like uh, when SCTV. I always forget the years, but they started to show SCTV on. I think even after Saturday Night Live, and that I began. Uh, so by the eighties, I was more even into that. But I, it's so hard to remember everything. I can't remember what years I've watched things, and I've stopped lying about how many things I've seen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When, I'm, I'm when used to be a big liar. Somebody about a movie. They're yeah. like, "Yeah, you love uh, such and such. Right? God, that's a great one." And then you realize, "I've never seen that." I've film. never seen it, or just in like foreign, you know, oh, f foreign films. Like I maybe I would lie and go, "Oh yeah, I've seen a lot of uh, French French films." I haven't seen any of them. No, maybe I've seen a couple by now. But the lying has to go. I've seen a couple of uh, Bergmans. So, yeah. but I, I, the lying, the lying is uh, you get caught eventually unless you're Trump. But even he looks like. Yeah. Well, I've never seen The Big Lebowski, and I love uh, the Coen Brothers. I just saw The Big Lebowski. Isn't that I weird? just saw it. I, I the same way. I would love the Coen Brothers. I and never them. saw it. I, I and I never wanted to s s see it on one level because everybody I knew, I was from a generation where people were still saying "dude," oh, yeah. so it was already old. Yeah. Dude, but then when you watch it, you go, oh, this is the greatest. <laughs> uh, I, I, I got to see it. it, it oh, you still haven't seen it? No. Oh, no, you'll enjoy it. It's Isn't really, really great. Isn't weird? It's not weird because the thing is, if you say, I saw it, uh, I was seven years older than you when you saw it. So yeah. that's all you have. You know, there's nothing but time, and if we believe... You uh, hope so. What's that? You hope so. No, no, I know that. Yeah. I'm ready for the hammer to drop. I don't expect to get out of this podcast alive. <laughs> I, uh, I'm armed for some reason. I'm open cap. I know you, it was weird. You're like, why do you have a pistol on your hip? No. Yeah. Uh, it's weird. It's not even an open carry state. You come to the podcast, you got with a, a gun, gun. and uh, you don't seem like a gun holder. Look, that's the thing. I play against type. <laughs> no, but I, I, as I get, as you get older, uh, I think you can back me up on this. Uh, not quite as old, but you start thinking about death more. I used to think about death as a kid. I thought we were going to live forever. That was five years old or seven years old. Oh, my God, we're going to die. I remember like, oh, how is it possible that we're going to die? Yeah. You know? But then I put it aside for a while. You do put it aside. Yeah, especially when you're like 18 to 30. It's not like you feel like you're invincible, but you don't worry about. Nope. You know, like. You and don't, you don't necessarily care. You're like, well, yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll be out. I'm a fucking badass. Except I cared when I uh, took uh, PCP by mistake. Oh, shit. Like in the, uh, like in the early 80s. That happened to me. Tell me what happened. That happened to me. Ooh, it's brutal. Well, they, they were selling stuff. And it, you know, a lot of times you can just blame yourself. I was, they were selling stuff called, PC, uh, called THC. THC. They used blue capsules. Uh -huh. There's no, you didn't buy THC separate. Uh, Never even heard of that it, until it, five years ago. Yeah, so... They, it was PCP what we had bought, so oh. I had, uh, so I had a couple of like weird trips because it wasn't very powerful. And then one time I went to a party, and the guy told me it was like another thing that it wasn't, like a snorting mescaline or something. Yeah. And I snorted like the smallest, whitest piece of powder. Yeah. And within twenty minutes, I thought I was going to die. It was the middle of winter in New York. I was draped over an air conditioner. Oh it shit! It was a party with my my cousins were there, and I was the <laughs> older cousin. And like, hey, 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 Andy, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, oh my god. Uh, I'm good. I'm good. And then it was like, of the, one of the maybe seven or eight times in my life that I thought, and usually from LSD. Besides this, I was going. I'm going to die. Yeah. Because you can die from PCP. Oh, yeah. You saw the school videos. You jump out the window. You rip handcuffs off. Yeah. You, you go over the overpass. That's right. That's, that's, that's all right. I, that's right. Yeah. I can't imagine. You know what's so interesting? You say that. You say that. And I, I ho certainly hope that uh, people aren't going to think differently than me that I bought THC and it was PCP. But these blue tablets that were going around that turned out to be PCP, we didn't know about PCP yeah. when I started. I mean, we heard about it. Yeah. 
It was big in New York. You always heard about like Dusted or right. Sherms or cr Crazy Eddies. There's all these names. Yeah. And you hear about it in the hip hop, early hip hop songs, you know? And I also heard it from the Beastie Boys. They were always singing about it. But I would know. I was at the age where I knew that's not what you would. I would if, if someone tried to sell me PCP, I forget it. it. So, but so I noticed in the first few trips that were just horrible trips, and you kind of liked it and didn't like it. I started to get angry at my friend. It's like I'm like a f small guy who is uh, can be harmless, and I start to go. Hey, what the fuck is your thing? And he's like, what the fuck is your thing? Yeah. And then we didn't realize you start to, and now I thought back of that, I thought back about that, not even not now, way back then, when I knew after all those experiences what I had done, I was like, yeah, it makes you feel aggressive. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's like, I'm not aggressive, and automatically, and you didn't, I couldn't even sense, it. that's the scary part, I couldn't even sense that that's what was happening. You, I was so focused on what, what my friend was saying. What the fuck is he doing, you know? Yeah. And it started to ramp up. And, uh, and that, that's interesting because I survived that. I don't know. I could be a, a researcher. <laughs> were you a big field. drug guy when you were young? I, I loved drugs when I was young. You're just bulletproof. You're out just, you'll snort anything. You don't even ask what it is. Well, yeah, I used to do this joke about how, uh, you know, go to a Grateful Dead concert and yeah. uh, someone would come up in their hand and they would have a, uh, like a, they put their palm out and they'd be covered with pills and they go, take three, they're weak. Take yeah. three, they're weak. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, we didn't even know, we didn't even know what they were. All we knew was that two would not be enough, right? <laughs> so yeah, I was, but also when I grew up though, I was very, not grew up, when I was starting to be a comic, because I, I wanted to be a musician and then I became a comic, I was very focused on like James Honeyman Scott and these guys who had, you know, taken... You know, I don't even know if they were, like in his case, he was on uh, the guitars for the Pretenders. Yeah, I don't know that he was a, dr a druggie. It was like he's a heroin addict, wasn't he? Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, I think he, but, I, I could be wrong. It, that I didn't know, but but it was, I, I related to it like, yeah, I could take a pill that I didn't know what it was, and I and I think so. I was pretty careful once I was an adult. Yeah, of of not uh you know, not at a Grateful Dead concert and with people I don't know. I I I would have been, but I could see myself doing it. You know, that's the thing. Yep. If, you know, you could be so close to, he's a friend of a friend of a guy who you knew, and yeah, he said it was cool. ecstasy. Yeah, <laughs> this is cool. Oh, my, uh, you're a deadhead? I'm a huge deadhead now. Growing yeah. up, I hated the dead. But now, in the last, I'd say, 15 years, oh, my God. Well, you have a completely different, um, like, I was a musician growing up, but I was into, like, uh, uh the, uh, the dead yeah <laughs> so I, I was actually in a band where we played dead no stuff shit. and then what'd you play i played guitar and i wrote songs and i uh uh i was like a singer songwriter guitarist person i was in a band where we did a lot of like uh all kinds of stuff but it was also the the time period where fleetwood mac came out and uh which was the, and where mu music was starting to change in different ways but like i wish people would be as into fleetwood mac as i am people group them in there with like you know pop oh yeah but oh. they're they're great so you talk are you talking early peter green fleetwood mac or the i don't rumors? even know that i oh, just yeah. know those two albums i don't know the one before oh, so, they oh. all came together oh, but the I one rumors you. yeah and Rumor. fleetwood mac oh, that shit is so intricate and radical yeah I just love the but george you came from a different thing right well, I come from everything growing up in the Bay Area. I just loved it all. I loved like Prince, then I loved ACDC, and then I loved, uh, you know, Johnny Cash. I just didn't like the dead because I was in the melting pot of it, and it was all these oh, Trustafarian yes. hippies. Yeah. And then once Metallica came around, I was like, yeah, this is my dead. Get out of here, you know? That's what I missed. Yeah. I know Brian Posehn. I have a lot of friends. Yeah. But I don't know nothing about that that whole, except for Led Zeppelin. Oh, I know nothing about, like... Any of that music? Did so you I ever feel, have you dove into it even at uh, this age? Well, I uh, you know I I was lucky to meet Maynard. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, and so I I've listened to more of his the group that it was uh, after Pussifer, uh, Pussifer, and then the one but the, but also the group before that he came out of was one or something. I don't know. Yeah. He, well, I mean, tool is just tool. Right. But then yeah. tool was something anyway, tool. And oh yeah. The one he did. Uh, yeah. With the guitar guy. Fuck. What did they call? 
my brain has been working lately too. Well, the good thing is if you're listening to this, yeah, you can take a break. We won't talk about anything heavy right now, but you can just look up yeah. who that was. But beyond that, you know, it, it, it's almost like there's an old Jew part of me that's like, oh, I can't with the thing and the screaming and the and the yelling. <laughs> I mean, I can go uh, to uh, Nirvana. I can yep. get that. I can do or is. Uh, People used to make fun of me when I would say Nirvana, <laughs> but when it gets, but I actually don't know enough about that kind of music. But well, I'm, 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 I want to be mature enough to say, obviously, there's stuff there. I just can't, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, did you get into the punk in the seventies, late seventies? More now, na- more now. Yeah, oh, now, yeah, right. More now, like that. I'm aware that I knew that the uh, what was the the Ramones were great. Oh, yeah. But I didn't know. I was really, I got really into Talking Heads. In 77. Killer. And I was almost obsessed with them throughout the early Did 80s. Did you go to CBGB's and see them and stuff? No, because I had moved out here already. Oh. Oh. I was a real scared person. I didn't go, as a, as a musician, I was in cover bands. Yeah. I was afraid. I moved out here in 78, to, and I wasn't going to, and, and the music scene was unbelievable here. It was oh, like the, uh, the the Clash, and uh, uh, not the Clash, Clash from the, but I mean the... Uh, like the X. X, right. Yeah, and uh, and uh, Black Flag. Yeah, and they, and they all came up, and they, so there was a big explosion, and uh, who's the guys, the two guys... Uh, Dave Alvin and Phil Alvin. Oh uh, yeah, the uh, oh, the Blasters. The Blasters. So I was crazy about that music, and then, but I wasn't, didn't feel for some reason I had no confidence, and so I couldn't go out to. I never went to those clubs, so I I thought I would be a, do original music during the day, and it was just it was just young and really feeling down on myself, and I kind of struggled for years, and then comedy was way different. I didn't go to do covers and comedy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I always said that, like, eventually, I think there's going to be cover comedians uh, in Vegas where they look just like Seinfeld, and they you know, catch Seinfeld in his classic 89 tour. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, that's really great. I truly believe that's going to happen. Any way they can kind of cash Because it could and, happen musically more easily, right? Oh, well, they do it musically. They'll do a guy that does exact uh, oh, that's Neil Diamond thinking. or right, Elvis. Yeah. So we're going to see a car on. It's going to be like, see Carlin, 84, you know, do his, uh, his, who's the baseball versus football, you know, whatever. I believe that's going to happen. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> or it could be jo- Jokey Oki. Yeah. You like a karaoke. Jokey Oki. Yeah. <laughs> you go up and you do a guy's bit. Some people are doing jokey Who, now. Uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> they're doing it without the formal. Yeah. They're the they're the 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 mainspring of it. Yeah. Who are? Put, can I have Seinfeld eighty seven? Okay. Who are these people? <laughs> What's the deal with with playing cards? Uh, my favorite bit he ever did was uh, when I was young. I was a Seinfeld freak. I'd go see him all the time. Yeah, I was just into it. Like, wait, so you grew up in San Francisco? Yeah, the Bay Area. Yeah. And where where did you go see him? I would see him at the Circle Star. I would see him in Reno. I'd see him in Vegas. Wow, you, were you like a, um, a comedy I a, maven? I was a comedy freak, uh, but I just didn't know how to do it, so I never did it. I, you know, I just played music, and then, and you were playing music at the time. I was right? playing music at the time, but you know, I'm in San Francisco. The '80s is giant. You got Kerry Snow and Bobby Slayton and that Morning Crew. You got Tree. You got Bobcat. You have. Uh, uh, Robin Williams, that's just massive. And that time period was unbelievable with the other cafe, the first other huge. cafe. It was huge. It was crazy. Uh, like, even like, uh, like I'm not crazy about, uh, well, he's very angry all the time, but I loved Rob Schneider's stand up when all he right. used to come. Rob Schneider? Yeah, and Mike Meehan and all these people. I mean, it was, I started comedy in 84 and went on my own in 86. So I was on the road between 87 and 92. So I used to come up all the time and play. This club in Sacramento called Laughs Unlimited that didn't pay well, right. but they were famous for not paying well. But then I would go into San Francisco and I would see all these amazing people. Well, Holy people City were moving Zoo. there for the scene. Yes, like it Marin was amazing. Moved there, these people. It was a a, a destination of you comedy. could name twenty or thirty really oh, brilliant comics who it was were radical. there. I I remember uh, comedy was so big, like you know they call it now the second boom, but uh, it was so big. That every, every shit bar from Santa Rosa, California to San Jose had a comedy night. 
It was yes. crazy. It was. It couldn't, it, I may even argue that there was too much comedy. But by that time, it was. It started to see when San Francisco went from those great clubs and cobs yeah. to. Uh, Purple re, onion. Uh, no, well, what do they call it? They still, one of them still there. I actually went there. Uh, no, it's in uh, like in the south, and it's like where Silicon Valley is. Oh, is Tommy where, T's. Yes, Tommy oh, T's. Yeah. Right. Now, I don't. Th- I think I did Tommy. I, don't, I didn't do well there. Yeah. But uh, and but they were very nice people. But there's when you go, that started to become when it was a boom and there were too many comics, then there became a, of those kind of one-nighter type rooms. And that was like not the scene of like San Francisco, you know? Let, let's talk about it. You moved to LA to play music. Your story is so similar to mine as far as you played music. I played music for years. And then you moved to LA to become like, a, you want to be like a songwriter, musician? Yeah. And you land here and at what time do you just tap out? What makes you tap out? Do you go to the comedy store one night? Are you at the improv? What happens? Well, what happened was when I first went to the, uh, like you, I was very similar to you. I was a huge, I didn't think about doing stand-up, but I was a huge, because I was doing music, but I was doing music, like like I say, really small time. But I came out here, I went to the comedy store in 78. I said, this is the greatest thing ever. And I just absolutely loved it, but I couldn't, I, I didn't think about doing it. So when I was doing music and wanting to be, you know, original, th- I started to get so frustrated and so angry at myself. Now I realize, because I've had therapy and just recently therapy, three yeah. years of therapy, and, and, and I've looked back and I was like, I was so f- hard on myself. I really, really kind of hated myself on some level and uh, had, had done like a lot of theater in college and had done a lot of music in college and came out crushed that i couldn't just come out here hey here's my you know here's my resume from college you know yeah so i was so depressed and then i started to have a series of day jobs so i sold i sold stereos oh wow i don't know if you had them up in san francisco but universal university stereo and pacific stereo and uh pacific stereo yeah yeah and who was that one guy was uh who was uh shadow stevens shadow stevens yeah he had he, he 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 sold federated for Federated, Shadow <laughs> Stevens for Federated. So I did all these, and then at a, a company picnic at the stereo store, this my, this guy Bill, who was a friend of mine, I met him at the store. I started doing impressions of everybody, and he said, "Hey, you should try comedy." And so I started with him. I wouldn't have even started if it wasn't for him. And maybe I would have. I think I would have. Yeah. <laughs> like say, but he. So then, I, all of a sudden, that was a completely different world. There was no question as to how to go about doing it, which I still think is great about comedy. It's very egalitarian music. It's so there's so many gatekeepers, and there's so much, so few clubs, and there's so, you know, it's hard. You know, I really felt lucky, and and then uh, also I didn't realize which. Like I always tell people, if anyone ever wants advice, I feel like. I took my sense of humor for granted. Like, I just thought everybody was funny. My family was funny. Yeah. So I didn't even, and I was so determined to be a uh, the Bob, next Bob Dylan or whatever. Oh, yeah, right, I, right. Yeah. So it, sometimes the things that you do well, you, you, take, you take for granted. You don't even realize they're a skill. Well, also, I, I, I would always hear from people, and it kind of gets to you after a while. Like, dude, you're so funny. You should do comedy. After your music gig, and you're going like, because I'd tell stories and stuff in between songs, and and, and then I, it would just kill you. It'd make you like, uh, you know, rebel even more. Like, fuck you. Oh, are, are you talking? If you're talking about the same thing that I'm talking about, I always found it hard. I wanted to talk more when I played music, uh-huh. and it was always shot down. Oh well, when I would tour towards the end, so well, acoustic. I mean, like when you first start. Okay, well, when yeah, but they, because when, I had to say, you know, they I want to hear you talk. A band anymore, right? So then you're telling stories and people are laughing, and I would riff on people if they were doing dumb shit in the crowd. Yeah, so that must have been fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I knew, and also I worshipped comedy growing up. I wanted to be uh, a comedian, seeing John Belushi. I wanted to be. I did. I wanted to be on Saturday Night Live. I truly wanted to be on there. I just didn't know how to do it. I was a kid. <laughs> I didn't know. It didn't seem like you could do it. I mean, Saturday uh, yeah, Night I, Live was in New York, uh, and the comics all looked old. They had sideburns, but they're only twenty. But to me, they looked like they were forty. You know. Yeah. And then uh, later, New York's frightening, though. What's like, that? I, I found find growing up in New York was frightening. Oh, I like bet. Uh, like uh, to me, I didn't grow. I grew up in Queens, so to me. 
I hated LA when I first got there. Now I love it. I love yeah. it to death. Yeah. But it was like uh, New York would have been. I'm kind of glad how everything worked out because New York was like a just so has an intensity to it. In in the late '80s, I would go back to New York and work. It was a whole different scene there. It was very much more a blue like not blue collar but more it was much more what was happening with comedy everywhere it was getting very uh you know t- like fake tough in your face kind of stuff oh yeah now th- then it changed because that they had like an alternative renaissance like in the 90s both in la and in uh in new york so th- now uh i feel it's a whole i feel like it's a great place to live if you want to be a comic oh it's great yeah so that's why i could see people not coming here but i love los angeles because we don't have an attitude like we're the best. Yeah, like, like it was like, and, and and like San Francisco has an attitude like we hate L.A. and L.A. doesn't even really know that the Isn't feud that exists. Hilarious? Yeah, I always say like I grew up in the Bay Area and I'm like, they're like, oh man, you you know you moved to L.A. Oh, sell out stuff like that. Yeah. I'm so like, where does that come from? Do you think? I, I have no idea. It's some some absurd. Uh, uh, almost a sport mentality, sporting team. Like L.A. is a team, and and I, I could think it could be involved in sports also, like fuck the Dodgers or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, but, that's true. To me, yeah. To well, me, definitely that's a big rivalry. But yeah, the way I look at it is like, hey man, we're all in California, so we're winning. Well, that's true. <laughs> uh, 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 other than the fucking shit gas prices and some other things, but dude, we all live in California. You right, know, like I can see people in like Oklahoma, like fuck LA. <laughs> I got a tweet once. I said, "Beautiful day in LA." A guy said, "Fuck LA," and I opened up his Twitter account. And he lived in in Toledo. Yeah, he doesn't want to hear it. I was like, it. "Dude, you don't you, you 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 don't get to fuck LA." What are you talking about? You should say you should say what he really <laughs> meant was I don't like Toledo. Yeah, and. I hate Toledo. Maybe he even hates Toledo. Yeah. And sometimes even living in Toledo, he says, fuck Toledo. So then when you come on, go nice day in L.A., he goes, fuck L.A. See, misplaced anger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect example of misplaced anger as if getting mad at you living in a, uh, look, if you live in Toledo, I know I have, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. But it's a Toledo is like almost like the, the go-to city when you think of a, uh, nondescript kind of city. So I've never even been there. I don't even really know what it's like. Yeah. But obviously, that guy has a little chip on his shoulder. <laughs> oh, uh, to, to just shoot fuck LA out on Twitter for fuck no LA. reason. You're like, what? <laughs> you know, where's the backstory? Did you move out here and tap out? Did your girlfriend ditch you for an LA surf dude? Or I don't know. Well, yeah. you know, the other thing is there's some truth to, like, there is a truth to the LA laid back or whatever stereotype or, or, or phony stereotype. But that's true of, like, a certain thing. Oh, you yeah. know, it's but like. I've met some phony people in New York. Yes, there's phony people Holy everywhere. Shit, they're everywhere. They're yeah. They're everywhere. Especially yeah. when you can be phony. Like in New York, like the comments used to be. Hey, give me fucking uh, not every comic because they were great comics, yeah. but you know, like, hey, fucking hey, so this guy says this to me. I go, oh yeah, oh yeah. Let me tell you, you fucking right. No way, that kind of comment. I'm not even yeah, doing yeah. it right. Busting balls over here, you fuck face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, oh, like uh, like uh, this uh, comic Bill Sheff used to have a bit about how uh, you know you go down to these uh, barbecues, uh, you know, down south or something where they go make your own steak or something, which yeah. I never heard of that place. He goes, yeah, yeah. I'm going to pay you seven dollars. I'm going to do the cooking, that kind of a thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and of course, I used to have a joke because when I first started, that was a. Uh, I'm, I'm not making fun of that joke, but I can make fun of everybody's joke, and that's how I'm in the trouble I'm in. Yeah. But uh, I used to have a joke. <laughs> I used to have a joke, and I'm not saying it was a great joke, but the joke was a. Uh, oh, someone's at the door. Hold on. And we're pausing. That's weird. Uh, hey, who came to visit the podcast? Yes. Wow, yes. you arranged that. I think that is. I can't even believe it. That is so cold, dude. That is the coldest <laughs> thing. I can't believe it. With the guy up. dropping it off. Say, can you make sure to come by during this time, this time, then? Oh, I wonder who that is. Oh, just, oh, it's the script for that movie I'm going out for. Yeah, yeah. From my management company. Yeah, that's what I'm fucking doing. You know what it is? It's a t-shirt from Pete Yorn. And he All right. To my manager I appreciate reason. that you let me go on, though. That was good. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I want to talk to you, Andy, uh, about comedy because you remind me a lot of me when I was in the music world of um, you take comedy, it's your life. I love comedy more than anything now. And I, I can't even believe I've 
That's why I said that there's no bitterness with me. I'm like just so happy to be in this business and I try to bust my ass and be good. But you remind me a lot of me when I was in the music business where you are the gatekeeper in your mind, right? And um, me with music, like this fucking band, this song, <laughs> these fucking guys. Yeah, and, and, but there is an interesting thing about you that I love, and it's you love what you do. And, um, you know, one of your great things, you, you talked about you get in trouble because you talk about people's comedy. Right. But you've always kind of, uh, you've kind of checked people. If you were a hockey player, player you, you check them into the wall and say, hey, that's, that's hacky or whatever. So <laughs> I like that analogy. It really is. Yeah. And, and I think there is a, uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, world where I do think that they need, uh, a world needs an Andy Kindler. I'm glad you said that because the alternative isn't good. But, you know, <laughs> I, I'm sure if you saw my, my stand-up, you'd be like, this fucking guy. Are you able to be friends with someone if you don't like their comedy? Oh, I mean, this is a, I, I, a, a long time ago. I'm not going to reveal who the comic was about because yeah. I wouldn't do that. But in this case, it's not my thing. But uh, my friend was saying that uh, uh, he was saying that we were, he was trying to arrange a dinner for all three of us. And then he was like, but his other friend or four of us, his other friend was like, well, I don't like that guy's... It was like me, bum, bum, bum. He goes, well, I don't like the other guy's act. And he goes, you're not going to go to dinner with the guy because you don't like his yeah, act? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I I, I never really even... Uh, uh, I don't really... Except when it comes to people like uh, Dennis Miller, who I think is actively mean, or people who are lowering the bar on purpose. I really... And because I have that that thing where I, I, I do like a once a year almost roast... And a lot, and over the years, I mean, if there's growth in my life, and I think there definitely is, and I credit a lot to uh, Prozac and therapy, and uh, you know, I'm not saying that's the only thing that did it, but uh, I used to get into very, uh, like, I would get in my mind the feud part of it or something. I would always get into the. It's like one year I had a thing with uh, 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 like Adam Carolla because I said he was like saying. I was basically saying he's he's kind of a racist. He says racist things. And so when it gets into that kind of a... And then I was afraid he was going to beat me up. This is before I got into therapy. I realized that my, my big fear is getting beaten up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, but, the, but the fear underneath that is the... But the, the, the truth I was missing underneath that was that uh, I was thought that I wasn't a man when I was younger because I couldn't fight. Right. In fact, I took Taekwondo for years to, not just to combat that, but one of the one of the reasons. And then in therapy, a year in, she's like, "Why would you, you know, like all these fights I've avoided?" Because so you really think the answer was to fight, you know? It's like, yeah. and and I realized my life was like a living like a movie. Like I'm um, I'm not the Karate Kid, yeah. you know. I'm not the guy yeah. in the uh, my bodyguard. My bodyguard. Yeah. One tin. What's the one? One tin soldier. What's a uh, Billy Jack? Yeah, oh, Billy Jack. Um, and so it's like that. If I had done that, I might have been killed, dead by now. And it's not make me less manly that I don't want to fight. Yeah. You know, so as all these things came out, and I realized that a lot of what I was doing was because um, I was angry about certain things, and sometimes they were based on my own insecurities. So I'm confronting these things, and I used to be so scared of, like, well, the, the year I went after Adam Carolla. I mean, I really felt... Like I could get hurt, and when I went at the uh, uh, Anthony of Opie and Anthony, it was it was all about stuff I be believe in. I mean, I just didn't like uh, uh you know, so I was like this, you know, whatever you're saying, you're doing this is racist. What you're saying here, and uh, then one year I went to Seinfeld, so I had this joke where I was like, I'm not, but like, I'm not, I'm not worried about Seinfeld fans coming after me. I was like, who are these, who's this guy that doesn't like Jerry? <laughs> you look out your window and there, there's a yeah. whole bunch of puffy shirt people out there. What's the deal with this guy saying negative things about Jerry? But in the last couple of years, I've realized that th I need to try and let that thing go. Like when I can let that go, it means like I can do the speech, not saving America, but saying things that stick in my craw or things that are like funny. Right. As opposed to I'm right and you're wrong, you know? And so, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, or, or, or like 
I made jokes about Leno because I, he, I should make jokes about him because my jokes about him are changing the planet. I mean, it's not really true. So I, I've, I've actually, I think, gotten more mature about it. And that part of that is also once I let go of the fear of getting punched and I really let go of it, yeah. I was so caught in the terror of thinking about getting in a fight that when I realized I don't have to get in a fight, it just was like there's nothing you – there's nothing you can say, like on Twitter, there's nothing anyone can say that's going to get me to the point where, okay, I'll meet you at the corner of Schmeckle and Schmanky. Yeah. I'm not meeting you out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so uh, that, then you let go of that as a power, and I feel much, much more safer as a person, you know? There is good stuff, though, to what you do, because I think... <laughs> I hope so, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, no, I believe this, though, because it does keep an industry in check. Uh, when people start to get big headed or they're mowing over other people or whatever, and you call them out on that, I believe in that kind of stuff. Or if you're, it's a court jest, it's like a court jester. Yep. And I also truly believe in um, keeping an art form, uh, an art form. I, I, I love comedy as, as cheesy as it sounds. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, be big and, and rocking, but I also am completely fine with working at the comedy store the rest of my life. That's it, the main. That is the main thing. It's all I care. It's all. About. It's all it is. It's all I care about is getting on stage, getting stage time at the store or the cellar or Comedy Works in Denver. These these rooms that are that mean so much to me, and and being able to keep the bar up to where they don't go ah oh, we're fucking this guy uh, you know so i like to have that kind of uh andy kindler on my shoulder of like <laughs> at least it makes me strive to be as good as i can be right right i That's can see that what i want to yeah. be and that is really uh you need a guy around like that once in a while but todd glass is like that too because todd glass is basically saying you know do you really, you know, do you really need to, you know, is that thing you say about gay people that funny? Yeah. You know, he, so he does a whole thing where, hey, if you want to do that joke, do that joke. But really, is that, because like, uh, that was true about, you know, Seinfeld when he was a few years ago, I don't play colleges anymore. I don't go near me because, because he, he did a joke about a gay French king. You know, like, you look at your clock, you're like a gay French king. And it's not like it didn't, they booed him, but it didn't kill. Yeah. So then it's like. He went to a whole thing. You can't. These people are too sensitive. But the truth is, in 10, 10 years from now, twenty years from now, you just you're not going to be able. If you look back at Johnny Carson in the eighties, it looks like a homophobia parade. Oh yeah, it's just uh, everyone's like uh, doing jokes about gay people or about feeling gay, whatever it is. Things change. Yeah, doesn't things mean, change. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't mean the. It doesn't mean you have to change. You're just not going to get the same laugh on the gay French king. Well, I think eventually people get so big that they're used to the safety net of their crowd their crowd that's true that's they're very constantly true constantly working their crowd and then one day they're in a situation where it's not their crowd last night i did a a show in front of 60 70 year old vets the promoter didn't tell me it was going to be old people and their uh, vets why wouldn't they say that i don't know he's <laughs> i'm doing a show at the uh memorial vets hall in uh in Orange County. I go, yeah, cool, I'll do it. I thought he's just running. We're in the venue. Orange County. Yeah, oh Orange my County. God. I'm in the Orange Curtain. Yeah. <laughs> and I show up and I'm like, all right, well, I've been I've been in this situation before. Let's do this. Let's start digging in. And I found it and it turned out to be great. Um, but to I think uh, what I love about Bill Burr a lot is he'll go in all different rooms to see what's going on. And I even talked about it last night with somebody. I would do a lot of UCLA uh, shows. I've been over there too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that really sets you into, oh, okay, I, I, I've, I can get this going here. Right, and, right. It, and you don't want to be like, okay, I, I cater to this crowd only. And you also don't want to be hacky like everyone loves my act. So you want to find that in That's between. Very, the you know? way you're saying it's so true because like, I, I was lucky that I came up in a time period where I played 40 weeks a year for like five years. So I'm trying to think, are you exaggerating? No, that's about right, Andy. <laughs> Don't exaggerate. Yeah. So I have played the worst one-nighters and, you know, for me and all this kind of stuff. Now, it's not like I go out of my way. Now, you know, I don't feel it's like I'm being uh, like – 
precious by saying if something is not going to be a fit for me, like right. opening up at an outdoor well, concert. Well, it's part or, in your career. Yeah, it's like you want to, I'm not trying to look for bad situations, but the fact that I've had them has uh, uh, absolutely made me a better comedian because yeah. there just is, the first time, you know, there's some people who never get upset, but the first time I was horribly rejected, it was horrible. You know, oh, it's God, like, it's brutal. yeah, it's just, it's more than the jokes. You feel as if you're, Oh, like you're the piece uh, of shit, and, and 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 I was hyper into being down on myself, but there could be that thing of like when you're at an open mic night or something, and it's 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 almost sad or something. Yeah. So I was like, I hated that when people would be like, you know, I know it's bad. You know, I'm telling you, it's bad. Yeah. So it's like, but when they get that silent, I feel so poor for. Oh, I hope he gets through it. That's no good. That's no fun. <laughs> it's no fun at all. It's no fun at all. And it's part of the thing. Yes, it it's is. It's so weird. It's like mining for gold. You're just on stage, and all of a sudden you shimmy the pan, and you go, fuck, there's some flakes in there. Oh, this bit's starting to work. Oh, God, I've got a bit. And then, you know, you're working it for a while, and then you go somewhere, and it just eats it. And you're going like, what happened? You're back to, <laughs> you're back to zero. Well, that's the thing too. A lot of times, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of all, you know, all, all turn, you know, what they call alternative comedy. And I was part of different movements and stuff, but I, I never, I, I didn't, I could see that sometimes there was the insulation of that they only had the people who grew up in that movement only had done certain things that fit those crowds. One hundred, one hundred percent, brother. And, and you can limit yourself to that, but. You could, but as soon as you open up to bigger things, I, I guess everyone is hates having a bad reaction at first. But when I started, you really couldn't pick the clubs, you know. Like yeah. now, you can pick clubs, you know. Obviously, people can see you online and stuff like that. So um, when you don't expose yourself to these other situations, you're just well, not going. You're just going to be a very insular kind of co comic. Is the danger? I saw that a lot when I started. The old Alt kind of comedy really, really hit in the 90s. But even, I would say, six, seven years ago, let's talk about some of the shows, 12 Shiny Nickels, uh, shows at the Virgil, and then, of course, Meltdown became a huge oh, one. Oh, great. And, in fact, I'm a big, I, I, I want to say I'm a big proponent of the of how comedy is going. I feel yeah. like the stuff that's happening today... Fantastic. It's, it's just... Anybody can do it. I mean, you can be any gender. I mean, it's like in the old, when I started, you, you were, people were afraid to say they're gay. They're I mean, there's so many, and there are people doing, uh, uh, like, there was like Lisa Traeger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I just love her. Uh, you know, I never would have thought I'd love sexual material that much. Like, so I'm opening up to more things, yeah. too. So I think now, and the, so you're right, when that whole thing happened, with those clubs you were talking about. It was funny when I was going in there at the time, though, the, the comics were completely cool. It was the uh, kind of the people on the outside that were like these fake gatekeepers that would be like, what are you doing here? You're a store comic. But eventually, everybody kind of dropped that stuff uh, and, and started to cross-pollinate. Uh, a lot of people. Uh, yeah, I, I would hope that's happening now because yeah, it's like... time. Now it's great. I, I hate when people uh, think that I'm... Uh, well, people... First of all, I hate that I think that people are thinking about me because they're not. But when people uh, think I'm... Uh, like a snob or something. I don't know what I'm looking at over there. Uh, they, snob, they, they're a snob or something alt, like that. An alt guy, a yeah, or, or It's like... That's not what I'm... It's like, to me... I played guitar before I got into into uh, comedy. Yeah. So when I when but there were a lot of comics doing these really bad song parodies through the eighties. It was funny to me. So uh, the idea of adding it's like the idea that you could have uh, like Fly of the Concords or anything or all these different groups that are I would never rule out a guitar in comedy, you yeah. know, or, or or anything, any I form. I ruled it out right away. <laughs> well, I did for myself. Yeah, for myself. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. well, I was so like, music is music, and comedy is comedy. Well, that was a, a really a, 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 amazing decision to make at that time because you you I think you would brought the guitar right in. You would have been like, Ooh. you would have just been continuing what you were doing. You would have used it as a. Uh, That's right. As a, uh, you know, just a, an act, not an axe. What is it? A crutch. Crutch, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I didn't tell anybody. I played music when I started. That's so great. At all. I just came in and I just took the abuse and the hazing 
and uh, look at this old guy. Oh, midlife crisis, all that stuff. And I just kept my nose to the ground and kept going. And then later, people were like, hey, uh, hey, I saw you. you. You were in a movie. I didn't tell anybody I did any movie. I didn't want because I don't want to go actor trying to do comedy, <laughs> ex musician trying to do comedy, all these gatekeepers, these these patio people. Yes. You yeah. Know? That you're going through. It's like a sea of just negativity. And I'm in there like, hey, my own en enemies are cancer, heart attacks, uh, global warming. <laughs> That's right. That's I don't, right. you know, are, are you kidding me? You think I give a fuck <laughs> about any of this? I just weaved right through, you know? <laughs> well, you have a very resilient personality, well, which I'm, I don't think or, I have. Or I could be stupid. I just, <laughs> no, no. I think it's like, it, it, well, the other part of it is when you have... You know, when you've had a, horrible, a, a, a Dylan level motorcycle accident oh, yeah. and you've had all these things, it's like you've already had things in your life that yeah. are enough to be upset about and wake you up. Well, there was one year <laughs> I got ran over on the motorcycle, hit and run, <laughs> diabetes and, uh, and uh, uh, kicked out of my apartment all in <laughs> one year. <laughs> and, and one was like two weeks after the motorcycle crash. Uh, I didn't get evicted. Just the landlord after 13 years was like, uh, I'm going to have to have you move. My daughter's moving in. I'm like, oh, dude, I got broke ribs here. <laughs> oh, don't worry. We're going to give you three months. I'm like, three months? I've been here 13 years. So it was like, you know, three horrible things. And I think what kept me going was, oh, I can get out of bed and go do comedy. This is fucking great. Yes. And that's what kept me going. If I had a shit job at 53... And miserable, I would have been like, I'm done. I'm right, done. right. I'm done in life. And I can get, I can get <laughs> Let's dark. Let's wrap it up. I can get right. dark. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but there was guys that were really driving me. I loved you. I loved, you know, Marin was really early on uh, uh, a savior to my uh, mind, seeing someone my age being able to talk, and then Burr, and just being able to talk to these guys that weren't competitive and were just into other stuff I was into, like music or books or yeah. not video games and, and getting high or whatever. It was just a, a it was a, it was incredible to me to be. Well, able. also that's age. Age. It's exactly. the, it's, it's like when I, when I think back now, you know, all the, the before Louis CK and all these things, it's like I had uh, so much envy and jealousy, which was also, also, Part of my problem was I wouldn't acknowledge, I acknowledge it, but was so guilty about it. Yeah. But now I've re realized through like therapy, it's like, you know, you can have these feelings. There's nothing wrong with these feelings. It's when you deny them that it's, you start to uh, get fucked up. But when I'm now, I can really say, or like, you know, all I care about is having, is enjoying myself. And what exactly what you're saying is doing club, doing stuff. I am feel so blessed that I haven't gotten, that I'm not. I still love comedy. Dude, like the it's day 63. I yeah. I mean, there's no difference many, in how much I love it. I guarantee if we wrote down all the guys that you started with, no one's doing it anymore. I'm lucky to have started out with, with and there's a great number of people. There's like, a, like a, I started out like with uh, Paul Feig. Oh, wow. And uh, I started out with uh, Apatow. And, oh, wow. Uh, and uh, a whole bunch of people who, that's also the, the, the other part of it is I started out with people who, I've had different kind of varying career. It's like the uh, it, it, it is so it, it's so exciting to see the different varieties of it. But I, when I was thirty years ago or twenty years ago, maybe even ten, fifteen years ago, I was still driven by this. What have I done? You know, what's my legacy? You know, things like you reject as stupid. Right. But then through therapy, I go, well, you can't deny you're feeling this way. You, you can't deny like when I die, no one's going to care about me. And then you get through all that stuff to. Who cares about that? Is a fiction. Yeah. You know, even if you were on, even if I was Raymond instead of uh, a recurring character, and everybody loves right. Raymond, uh, I'd like to convince you. Know, I you you can make me make a strong argument right now. I would have had a better life, oh. right? I, I could say that, right? Yeah. But it's not true. It is not true because it's not true. Uh, because well, Ray and I both have the same OCD. Yeah. You know, and he has a heart thing. And I'm not rooting against him. I'm just saying it's like right. the grass is always greener. You always think it's that people... It's always greener. And the happiness is not based yeah. on the thing that you achieved, unless you want to call achieved, the ability to do stand-up or yeah. whatever you want to do, the ability to create stuff. I, 
I absolutely love Raymond. Uh, all you know, um, I loved the show, uh, that show, and then I loved um, the one called uh, Men of a Certain Age. Oh my God, I love that show. That I, show was made for us. I mean, I'm the old, older, right, yeah. I'm the elder statesman in the group. I think that show, and unbelievable. I, I talked to him at the cellar at the table, and I also think he is an American. Uh, just a, a jewel. Uh, when I see that man, I smile. It's pretty yeah. bizarre. He's he's a, he's a, first of all, you talking about Raymond, right? Yeah, oh, he's yeah. an amazing actor. Oh, oh god, and, he, oh, the Irishman. I just saw him on the Irishman. This fucking guy, man. And he and I loved his new special. I watched him work it out at the cellar, and he's talking about his kids. It is fantastic. He's always been an amazing stand-up comic. You know, he was a great, amazing stand-up comic going in. But I think it's a perfect lesson about perceptions. And like you say, you know, people, oh, now you're, uh, you know, uh, oh, now you're, oh, musician guy's doing comedy now. Oh, yeah. son of a, son of a actor's acting. It's like, he was so, people, I know a lot of people like, oh, yeah, he's, he, he's good as he, when he first started on Raymond. So he maybe had some adjustment time. But he was always, He's a great actor, oh. you know, and th I think people did want to pigeonhole and say they do want to do that thing. They go because there are people like uh, who's the guy from uh, <laughs> uh, the family guy who's like who, the inventor of it or the uh, which guy? Uh, the guy who's the who wrote Family Guy and he's oh, and all of a sudden he wants to be a crooner. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you know, yeah, he's right. like, you know, yeah, that kind of stuff. I do get suspicious about. I'm not going to say he of can't course. do it. Yeah. But when when you can. Okay, I want to. I want to be uh, Frank Sinatra. I can pay for that experience. Yeah, that I can be suspicious about. But in general, it's like the stuff he's done, Ray, and he was great in the uh, the thing with. Um, I can't think of it. Kumail was in that movie. Kumail. Oh, oh, uh, oh no, that movie's amazing. The and he's Big funny, Sick. and he's funny as Holy his father. Holy shit, he's killer on the Big Sick. Yeah, I, mean, I love this man, but that show. I told him straight to his face. I. I and it was great because I know a lot of people are like, big fan, of, uh, everybody loves Ray. I know he's heard that a million times, like Dylan. Oh, I love everybody, you know, whatever. Like people, they just get hit with the one thing. I love everybody them. loves Ray when they say to Dylan. Yeah. Thank well, you very much. I, yeah. I enjoyed being on that show. <laughs> <laughs> but when I, I sat next to him um, at the cellar and I said, hey, man, I just want to tell you that that, that men of a certain age was some of the greatest TV writing I'd seen in years. And he goes, you know, it's just a bummer that more people didn't see that. And I said, you are fucking correct. It's a bummer they didn't let it play. I know. There's never a reason. That show was on trying to find an audience and uh, when TV was changing. It was changing. Yeah. It was and at it's the like, wrong time. And the like, uh, everybody who recognizes me from Raymond, almost everybody did did not not everybody but many of those Raymond 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 fans they didn't they don't like that show that's you know? what's crazy that's what's crazy about you know it because it's like? the it's show's like a band when they go whatever happened to the black crows <laughs> they go what do you mean they put out like seven records you ditched them after she talks to angels i, I would never ditch a guy if i'm a fan of something you right. know i'm going to go to see his work and i go eh, i didn't like that but holy shit uh, you know i've been doing this with Matt Dillon his entire career I go I see all Matt Dillon films, just like yeah, hey, this guy fucking he he never made the weird wrong turn as the child actor. He didn't you know he didn't overdose and everything, and he's just doing quality work. A lot like Sean Penn, they just constantly did these films, uh, what they wanted to do. And I don't understand if you loved Raymond, you didn't watch uh, Men of a Certain Age. It was the 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 burn of that thing, the slow burn and the writing and the the dynamics of the dudes was so great. I think what it is is that when things reach a certain mass of popularity, it's not like you're going to get people who aren't capable of of liking two things, but you're going to get a lot of people when you when you have that big a creation, you get a lot of people who really are into a certain kind of comedy or they're into sitcoms or whatever it is. And I think if you sat them in a room and, you know, pay them to watch things, yeah. they could let it go. But when they watch something and there's a person they recognize and then they all of a sudden plug in their pleasure experience from the other show. Yep. And they're waiting for that to happen. Oh, it's weird, right? And it's like... It's like getting a new wife. Yeah. You're trying to compare it to like this other wife. 
Yeah. Like, what are you doing? This is the new one. This is the new thing. That's and funny. and so that's what I think it is. But you're absolutely right. And you're not understating it. You're not overstating it. That show, uh, I can't think of a show I liked more on television than that show. It was uh, John Manfrelati was in it, and oh. he was great. Oh, he's great. Uh, 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 who's the guy who... Uh, uh, the, the white dude. The, the guy... Uh, that played the player. Uh, he was always going after girls and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, why can't we remember names? But the, he was the... Uh, uh, he was also wasn't he in a supernatural thing when he was younger? Okay, Scott, 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 something. Bacula. The the casting was crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was great. It was crazy. Matt Price was I was thinking of the oh. guy at the salesman. Yeah, I, yeah. I, ha, having sold stereos, I loved all that sales stuff. Oh, yeah. When you were on Raymond, did it start to just put? butts in the seats for comedy touring. The reason I ask this is because it seems these days you can be on TV a lot and it doesn't put butts in the seats. There's, I think there's really, what do you think? About 20 people that we know who they are, they do the theaters and arenas now, and everybody else seems to be at this other paper the room uh, level, no matter if you're on a show for years or what. So did it change for you? No. Not Raymond, not Raymond, uh, because uh, if I was Raymond, it would have. Right. Because there, but it's a little, and I'm sure there are people at the club level who, as seen on, I mean, ha, as a credit could work for, for, for me, maybe, at the, on the margins. The only time that I, I saw any really uptick was when I was a, 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 a judge in that last comic standing thing. There we go, yeah. So then for a year, my price went up, and I maybe drew more people, but not that much. So I think it's a weird thing. Like, look, you know, Gaffigan says he doesn't even know how it happened. You know, it's just like he did this number of Comedy Central specials, he did a number of things, and then it just all comes together and it reaches critical mass. Right. I think what you're talking about is... is uh, I don't think I, I don't think I quite feel like I'm I'm pa- that things are being papered or, all the time. Yeah. But I think it's a struggle. Whenever I go on the road, I feel responsibility to promote it, and it's hard to promote it, because I don't want to come on tweeting every five minutes. And even if you did tweet every five minutes, this is people don't have Twitter, you know. Yeah. And I don't have Instagram. I don't. I know you probably do. Yeah, I want to get you on that though too. I know, but for some reason, I don't it's like, just fun. It's better because I there's know. no fucking animals out there, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> you, you know it's like I, I enjoy the Andy Kindler photos of walking around the old neighborhood of like hey look at this I walk by that same place every day at the gym where it had the Madonna picture and there's like uh, jewelry and incense in the oh, store oh yes and you're like what yeah. the fuck and you that's took my a picture favorite. one day I go what is that store that's my favorite place right? the, uh, what the, the fuck is that the, the next to the cigar smokers <laughs> the cigar smoker, yeah. and we have two cigar smokers uh, stores in our area, and they're fantastic. Yeah, because they're fantastic, but they look like you're entering a different planet. It's so where weird. everyone is joined by the fact that they like to all smoke cigars. Yeah, and then you go past that. It's so bizarre. Then their head shops. I think still. It, I, I think it would be great for you to be on there uh, because you you have these funny uh, points of view, and they're getting blown out by fuck Trump. Oh, fuck you, you libertarian! And meanwhile, <laughs> here's Andy Keller with this funny photo and this thing, and it just blows by. No question, no question. I I, I think I'll I'll look into it. The other thing is like, I got out of Facebook because Facebook uh, was so terrible <laughs> and for, for an OCD that's, that's person. Garbage, man. So I, and then with Zuckerberg and he, I can't yeah. stand him. Yeah. So Twitter I like because it's a short format. Yeah. Boom, you tell a joke. You I tell get it, it. Yeah. But you can still get into that maelstrom of hate. Woo. And, <laughs> Ooh, and so, uh, like someone a couple of weeks ago, like I love David Crosby, right? So I follow him, and I, lo- I love love, the, him. love his goings on, there. right? So a couple of weeks ago, he says something political, and the guy goes, "Oh, what, you know, comes, watch out, children of America, David Crosby is weighing in now." A guy from the, like he, first of all, David Crosby is known for. Uh, his whole life for, for being a protester absolutely and, you know, his and, whole and, life. and, and so I mean, Ohio he, right. you know, the song Ohio is the original uh, and he's not coming on to tell you what to do he's just coming all. it's just he's his opinion what's happening and so this guy I, I, so I said something to him he ignored me but later on he retweets like Crosby says to him uh uh, oh yeah, that he goes. Uh, oh, well, if you're being snarky, you know, I think it's your problem or something like that. Yeah. Or s- snotty. Yeah, like yeah. If you're being snotty, it's your problem. And then, uh, but then the guy retweeted. 
his thing and Crosby responding and he goes, Sometimes I love Twitter. That made this idiot's day. Yeah. Yeah. It's yo, ridiculous. Totally. That's not good. No. No. <laughs> and they go, oh, man. Remember when you heckled Lou Gehrig? Or, I mean, I don't understand the. Uh, it's fucking crazy. When man. you got uh, Lou Gehrig upset on uh, the gramophone Twitter. Gramophone. <laughs> oh, man. I. I I, I, I absolutely love talking to you. I was, I was pretty excited when I saw you at the airport because uh, I, I am a big fan of, of you. I, I just love you. Like, you're just this, you're this neurotic, crazy dude. I see, yeah, like, I see, hey, you fucking guys are, you know, like me and Marin are going to the show. <laughs> you fucking, you guys are late. Get in here. You know? And I'm like, this guy is great. And you're funny as fuck. And jo- Joey was cracking me up because... Oh, he's he's just a and he starts talking about something about a guy in '95. I forget what it was. It was just great. Can you imagine a roundtable show where it'd be like, say, you, Joey, uh, a Marin, and 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 say uh, an Ali Wong. Let's just say, just throw in these kind of totally different personalities and yeah. just talk about weekly stuff. Well, the thing that was so great was like when we entered the. It's almost like you're going on. This is a show. It's you're almost go, you're going on the, a show that is a repeating show where you get to see other comics in the airport. Yeah, and it always happens the same way. You just kind of like you you gravitate towards each other, and then it becomes a whole different ex- existence. It's it's beautiful, you know? though. and that's why I like it when you, when I can get to play festivals. That's the beautiful thing when it because. This thing that we have, these comedians, when we get together, it's it's so awesome, right? It's right, like, right. Like, oh my god, it reminds me a lot, as cheesy as this sounds, when all those '80s bands went to Russia to play the uh, drug thing, <laughs> and they flew over on the same plane, and it was just I haven't seen that. What oh, is this? It's called um, God. I can't remember, but it was like it was all the '80s bands, like Motley Crue, Bon Jovi, these big bands, and they're on a plane to to Russia. And it always reminds me of that, like, only us realize, like, maybe your Sunday show was a beat down. You had some drunk people or a bachelorette party. You're going to the airport just wounded. And then, That's right. Oh, yeah. Andy. It's an oasis. You're like, oh, <laughs> dude. And you sit next to each other and you talk about how fucking shitty it was. And then you go, I love this. And you get on the plane, you know? Well, that's how you saw when we're going in, like... The thing about getting on that shuttle is we're going. Oh, that's I thought great. about that a long time that day because uh, 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 this it was like you were starting to spri- you know we're spritzing and we're on this shuttle to, and we don't know what it's going to be like when we get to the yeah, lot, the new Uber, the lot. new Uber taxi lot, and so my 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 luggage goes sliding. Oh, it yeah. just went oh, sliding my God, it took down, off. and I. I've had this luggage for a year, and I still cannot get used to the fact that you it rolls in yeah. every direction. So it goes down the the thing, and it collapses with a loud noise, but it didn't hit anybody on the bus. Yeah. But I noticed when I went back to my seat, and I was like saying things like, "Well, sorry, everybody, I, uh, I, you know, I don't know what's going on there." This guy, I could see he made it like to his friend made a big roll of the eyes. Yeah. Like, yeah. like I'm a crazy guy on the a shuttle. New fucking traveler. He <laughs> yeah, yeah. like a million mile traveler, right? He's like this fucking new guy look at this guy grandkids yeah Yeah. this guy can't yeah yeah this guy didn't know how to fucking handle luggage (laughs) (laughs) what was that experience like to be on last comic standing being the andy kindler the the guy that is the oh this bit what were you sitting in that seat going like what the fuck oh well no because the thing was i was that did that when I took the decision to make the show because I had never, I'd made fun of that show so often. Right. And so, and I, and I really needed the money. Yeah. And, and it was like, and I, I didn't know I would get to work with Geraldo and yeah. so, which was amazing. But I, the thing was, so I had to like eat a lot of whatever the thing was. Like when I do shows, I go, I, you don't have to say anything about me taking this job. I, I, I you know, you're all coming up with better jokes than I, But the thing that was happened to be amazing about it was I took it, but only on the, uh, I didn't want to be a Simon Cowell. I didn't want to be mean. Yeah. You know, so to me, I was like, I didn't want, to me, it's like not funny to do a, a, a roast of somebody who just started or whatever. Right. So, and they, and this happened to be the, because there was a lot of um, uh, monkeying around on that show or like, you know, anger from comics who were th- arbitrarily thrown off or something. I didn't have any of that the whole year. So it was me, Natasha, and, uh, and uh greg and uh 
it was actually a good experience. Once they got to like when they narrowed down, I felt out of it by then because I, I don't I don't think it was my my place to say if I like all these comics, not my place to say, Well, you did good tonight, but you should open with the barber routine. Oh yeah. You know, like your your opening joke was the wrong move. Who would who what yeah. comic would really want to relish being in that yeah. Or think they could be in that role for somebody else. That's a brutal role because it is. Uh, it, it, it is. I remember Kennison said something uh, that really rung out to me when I was starting. Don't do contests. That was his rule. His, his, they say, you got any advice? Don't do contests. He wouldn't say anything else. Right. And I realized why. It's because most of America is like, well, if Andy didn't like him, the guy, I guess he's not funny. <laughs> You know, because they don't know comedy. I mean, these three know comedy, and he didn't win. Maybe he got third, but he didn't win, so he's not funny. Well, also, it was like, you know, Kennison came out of the whole Star Wars. Not Star Wars. Star, Star Search. Search. Yeah. yeah, so it was like, yeah, that, was that, it, that yeah. show for its time, I think, has a little campy element in a yeah. way. Like, I love to watch the comics went on there, but I never would go on there. I didn't put down people went on there, but it's like, you know, I think Kennison's like reacting to, at that point, it, it does seem like, yeah, it's all this uh, crazy, uh, you know, the way the way reality shows became. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I found Sinbad on there when I was young. I watched comedy on there. Me and my mom, we were, we enjoyed it. You know, when you're young, I didn't understand the uh, the the differences of comedy. It, oh yeah. If it just made me laugh, it made me laugh. I was a prior freak. I was a Cheech and Chong freak. I worshipped Carlin. I loved Saturday Night Live. I also liked Sinbad. Right. <laughs> That's just how it was. Like, that was a fucking funny bit. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you, know, it's, uh, you it's, see where in Sinbad, I love it so much when he's on Eric Andre's show. Oh, and, I love uh, Eric Andre. You, and he, Eric, I mean, I, I think Eric Andre actually drove him crazy because he kept doing this like, and your answer is, and, it was, and they wouldn't stop. Oh. They wouldn't stop. And finally, I think uh, Sinbad <laughs> destroyed the machine. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. You know, like, uh, the example I always give is, like, oh, someone like Brian Regan yeah. or or even someone like Gaffigan. It's like their act is clean, and uh, it's not, that's how I care. I don't care that it's clean. I don't think they care that it's clean. They're just funny people. Yeah. And so you can be really funny and be a huge crowd pleaser, too, you know? Yeah. Nate Bargatze, one of the funniest guys yes. I know. Yes, perfect example. One of the funniest example. guys I know, man. And I watch him a lot and try to uh, write cleaner. And I watch Marin a lot. Marin will say things once in a while like, you don't need that fuck there. And he's right. And I'll drop the fuck and you, you get the insecurity. But right. But after a while you go, oh, it is working. I, I, you get just so addicted to a big fucking smasher. <laughs> nah. it, to it, me, it, it truly is a drug. But it's also... Uh, it's just something I'm like always chasing, like a hit song, not a hit song. I don't, I don't care about a hit song, but a great song where it just has that hook. Yeah. And you go, holy shit, this song has got a hook. Yeah, when man. something is great, it's yeah. okay that it's a hook. Yeah, because that's Petty, you know, man, Yeah, the fucking guy. Oh, yeah, oh, that's a perfect example perfect because all, example. all of it, like you keep thinking, you can think about the songs you did and then you can sit there for like an hour and you would keep coming up with more not just hit songs, but like anthem, anthemic. Yeah. The, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to live like a refugee. And Break down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All these great anthems. You go, yeah. whoa. She was a good girl. Crazy about Elvis. It's so great. Oh my God. He is such a God. I miss him. That, him, him I miss a lot. I mean, not saying I don't miss other people, but yeah. the way he past was bad i miss him i miss brody stevens oh my god yeah i miss him uh, he 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 is that's such a huge loss and also it's almost like you can't capture the definition of what comedy is in a way more than him like like one, one time he had this joke uh during the, I mean, the 2008 economic thing it was like a big yeah, everybody, all those uh, companies went out of business and everything. And so, and it was a recession. He goes, I'm, I'm cutting back. I'm no longer having the LA Weekly delivered. <laughs> I'm doing my part. <laughs> so he was, to me, a perfect example of someone who we wish 
could have been happy, happier. But besides that, just plugged in on a almost supernatural or surreal level to the core of what's funny and also the core of what's sad in a way, you know? Yeah. You know, like, like yeah. you know, yeah. I'm doing a lot. What was this thing? I'm doing a lot of uh, Lebanese, Lebanese uh, Pakistani modeling. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just got a land in a movie. It shoots in Chatsworth. It's a solo scene on a yoga mat. <laughs> just, oh, my God. I'm doing modeling uh, for... Yeah, the Pakistan, uh, like a razor or some kind of razor <laughs> commercial. Oh my God. I mean, Andy yeah. Kindler yeah. is here. So I made him like for years before any, not before anybody knew who he was, but back in the days when like it was uh, Zach and we would play this place. I forgot the hookahs. Uh, and I forgot the name of the place, but uh, the Gypsy Cafe, I think yeah. is what it was. But he was just for years would be creating this character that seems fully formed every time. I met him back in 1990. Oh, he came up to me. He was at, oh, I was doing something in Seattle, uh, and he came up to me with a film crew and interviewing, and you're Andy Kindler, and I'll be coming down. I'm coming down to Los Angeles. <laughs> and just this, <laughs> just is amazing. I mean, really, yeah. the, maybe the funniest person yeah, uh, yeah, ever. It makes know? me sometimes. I I I got his photos here and over here and his baseball card and his his bracelets and and uh, you know his I got the laminate over there from his special. I opened the special shoot and were you were you there uh, when at the tribute? Because I yeah, was there yeah, yeah, at the comedy yeah, store. Yeah, and Jeff Ross. That could may have been Jeff, the funniest thing. That was one of the greatest greatest, greatest lines things. I've ever heard in my great. life. I. I hate I hate you. You know the whole thing was like I'm not going to be your friend. He's like you're going to be my friend. <laughs> oh my! But what he said what? And I was saying, Brody's friends and family that were sitting right behind me in a booth. Yeah. And when Jeff Ross got up there and goes, uh, now that I've heard, uh, you know, now I've heard a lot of uh, of uh, Brody's friends, uh, you can see why he committed suicide. Oh man! Unbelievable! Yeah. I don't even think I delivered it the right way. Yeah, yeah. They burst out laughing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. I think that it's, uh, I'm never going to be able to get over that. And That's true. And uh, I go to the store and I just hear him there. I feel him. And uh, I miss him big time, man. It, it makes me cry. It really does. Um, Sneaks up on you, too. It, it, because he's like so, someone that was always part of my consciousness just so know? warm too you know so it's uh, it's it, it's it's wild to think about 10 years ago i didn't have any of these friends 10 yeah, years that's ago amazing. next month december is that when you started december 6 2009 i didn't have any of these friends and now i cannot imagine my life without these people so when one goes away it tears me the fuck up. Yeah. It tears me up, man, because it's just like, wow. It's, uh, I, I can't believe what these people mean to me at this point in my life. Like, I was just a, 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 I call them Hollywood tumbleweeds. You know, I played music all my life, and all of a sudden now I'm not playing music. My friends have kids, have married, moved on. They're in Santa Monica. They're, they're in soccer <laughs> practice, and I'm just like, oh, what do I do? And then I get a whole new batch of lunatics, and right. they're so deep in my heart. And like I said, when I saw you at the airport, I was like, that's fucking Andy. That man. is, uh, that is uh, meant to be. I know, we don't like to say these type of things like... Uh, things are meant to be but on some level they are meant to be even on ways that we can't figure it out but come after me you atheists yeah yeah <laughs> come after me i'm saying that the uni yeah you know the thing is like when I, those cracker people go if there's a gut you know they go if you believe in god how come how come there's death and things like cancer stuff yeah like that. whoever said that whoever said that that was going to solve people who have been members of religions for thousands of years yeah. i think they know people die Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so the basis of it is in like, I'm going to get in this religion 
If this if this guy. god if this god guy yeah. could figure out and make sure that everything is right, then yeah. I'll believe in that per- person. I'm on board as long as I'm not dying. <laughs> it's so one dimensional. Right? What's that? It's scary to die now. It's weird because as I was getting this fucking neck procedure done, I laid there and I realized, you know what? I don't need anything at all except for comedy and these friends and to be able to get up each day. That's it. Everything else is all bullshit. Well, it simplifies your life and it makes your focus it does. just on, uh, especially when you're going through pain. Because you like Ram Das at all? R-A-M Das, Ram Das. He's like the Be Here Now guy. He was... Uh, uh, I don't know uh, him. He was T- Timothy Leary's partner at, uh, at Harvard and oh, used right. to be... Uh, I uh, like a, you know he used to be at Harvard and then he went he dropped acid and then he wrote these books and he's yeah. he's almost dying now and he has like a, a couple of videos out where it's just unbelievable the the way that he approaches the 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 now moment yeah. you know and so it's 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 weird because when it's cheap and like when it's taken in, and it's like uh, into something like the secret or something like that right. or, or people think. You create your reality. That's not what anyone's saying because the Jews didn't create the Holocaust. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's just a misunderstanding. Right. But but uh, so it sounds it sounds like corny, but it but but some of these things are actually true. They're one hundred percent true. Yeah, I believe that, and uh, and that's why I don't. And, and I have doubt too. Oh, you know, yeah. it's like people go, oh fuck yeah. It's like people, go, oh so like do you believe in whatever, and so. No, I don't believe, really don't believe anything. I, you could get me on a bad day and, yeah. you know, and I am scared of dying. But actually, I feel like more, I'm proud of the way whoever is in uh, nature or whatever, how we age. Yeah. Because the way we age, if you can keep most of your parts in shape, you start to realize it's just, it is just about the moment. Yeah. And I'm no, I'm no more ready to die now than I was when I was 30. And... So it's in a sense, it's always like this. You don't, you know, you could write your own ticket and go. Well, you get you get a cold, and I can go. Oh my God, this is it. But who knows? Nobody knows, nobody and knows. nobody knows. Uh, you know who's Rory? Uh, he's a great comic. Rory. Scoville? Yeah, he he had something to say the other a couple weeks ago. He was like. Nobody knows what happened. He goes, these guys who are like are so angry about people believe this or believe that. Nobody knows what happens when you die. Nobody. And it's really true. It's true. You can come up with yeah. all of these things about how I can show you so, uh, mathematically that the chances of us continuing in some other form, blah, 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 it doesn't matter. You haven't, you, the person, has not gone through it yet to see what will happen. Yeah. And I feel like the more you can, like, you just do comedy because you love it, the more you can just be drawn to things in your life, music, whatever it is, then you, you can turn your mind off. I think the only thing that makes me mad about comedy is how much I love it because now I don't want to die. <laughs> <laughs> if you would have just caught me 10 years ago, I'd be like, right, ah, right. fuck it. You know, I remember one time I was on a plane and it fucking dropped like 10,000 feet. Oh my God. And I was just sitting there and I was like, eh, I'm good. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm good. But now I'm like, holy shit, I, don't, I quit sugar. Okay, I quit, you know, I, I, I work out every day. I got to see this through. You know, it's so funny that you said it because, like, my wife and I, the better our, I know this is going to sound like a cliche, but, you know, you know, the better our marriage gets, which just happens to be getting better, the more we miss each other. Like, it's, oh, it's like, I can't leave now. I can't go now. You know, it's almost like you build up the fears. Yeah. So the truth is, is that whatever it is that you, you can't go through life not, being intimate or not embracing things and those things do always remind you that you could lose them yeah, yeah. you know so I, yeah. it, it's like a when my my therapist had me focus on yes you're anxious about going out of town i'm not anxious about the plane i don't no. some things i don't care about yeah but i'm anxious about you know what what will my you know will i see my wife again and what, yeah. and uh and she went when i looked at it that way i was like okay it's natural to be anxious and then i don't have to walk around going Pretending not to be anxious or telling yourself you're crazy, you know? Absolutely. Or not going on the road. Because I could see I could see a life where someone would go, 
I'm not getting on a plane. I'm not getting on a train. Oh. I'm staying in this cabin right here. Fuck that. <laughs> with a mountain of weed. But you'd get t- tired, I think. Mountain of weed. <laughs> yeah, you get tired. I think you, you, you get you, tired you, of everything. Like you go, I'm only doing this. And you go, I'm burn <laughs> on that. I'm good. I'm going to stay home now. Oh, I got to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. That's the rock and roll life I've always lived. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't, if you don't have those things, it's like it, you lose the, you wouldn't want it to be the same way all the yeah. time. Yeah. What do you got coming up, dude? You got some. I do. Uh, when, I don't know when this is coming out. This be out uh, not this Monday, but the following Monday. Oh, that'll be good. Is that uh, is that the week of uh, Thanksgiving? I'll tell you right now. Let's look, Big Daddy. Big Daddy is Big, coming down the tracks. You got it. It'll be out you, the twenty fifth. You got it. Yes, it's Andy Brody's Kindler. Andy Kindler Brody. Yeah, that's perfect because I will be at Union Hall. Oh God, that's a great. Place. I love it. This, oh, I love that place. The Saturday after Thanksgiving. Yes. That and then the thirtieth, su- and then the Sunday, December first, I'll be at the Good Good Comedy Theater in Philadelphia. This awesome. is the first time I've ever plugged something that was con- at the time period or could make sense. Usually, it's, it's like that's great. Please plug the fact that I'm very nice. Oh fuck. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to say thank you so much for doing the show. I absolutely love you. and I love uh, you too, man. This it, is it's just We connected very quickly that way. Yeah, and I could talk to you for hours. I love to talk to people that have been in comedy for years and years and years. I don't know shit. I'm just a fucking dot in the, in the world of comedy, just a, a, a speck of 10 years. <laughs> but guys like you, just full journeymen, uh, Marin, you know. Uh, but you can't discount all the years that you. No, not at all. Because those no. are also. Well, I've done forty five hundred shows. So. Yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> not, you can't discount that. It's I'm like, not discounting that. I'm just saying, it's great to talk. Because to. I'm telling you, you can't do it anymore, and I'm yeah. discounting. I'm just kidding. I love, <laughs> my favorite thing is Burr says all the time, like, "Look, man, just don't quit. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get anything if you quit. You're going to possibly not get anything if you stay in it." But you definitely might get something. <laughs> that is absolutely the best advice you I can give. I love you don't it. know what you're going to get. Maybe you won't get anything, yeah. but this is what it's about. And if you stop it, you're certainly not going to get anything. I've already made it. I, yeah. I, just work. I get to work. I get to hang with you guys and, and do comedy. So and you it. people listening, eat your hearts out. Yeah, you got it. This one's for Brody Stevens. Yes. All right. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> hey, Kindler. this was great. Thank I you for having you, me. And, and uh, this couch, I'll be oh. sending you a bill for my uh, oh, yeah, chiropractor right. or couch something. This sucks. Well, I mean, that's the problem. It's too good. And then we're you can't you, you can't slump down. Yeah, you we're can't short. Slump down. I got neck surgery, so I gotta I gotta sit sideways like this. Maybe so that's what we needed. So I don't get to get this uh, conversation going. Yeah, let's say you got any couches you don't need. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I no. love that whole Ventura Boulevard. Going out of business. You've been in business 30 years. I also love the whole venture, uh, the area that we live in. I don't like my couch anymore. Yeah, so just, I just bring it out is. any day, right? They just put it on the street. That's it. Or yeah. is, is it worse? They go, these people are pretty goddamn lucky. They get my 30-year-old mattress. I hope they appreciate it. Yeah, hey, hey, I'm hooking you up with a freebie here. There's only two bed bucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that made it hurt. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you. In. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Leave a review on iTunes and check out the YouTube channel, uh, Dean Del Rey, and the Patreon bonus episodes, deandelrey.com, uh, all your tour dates. See ya.